ओम सत्यम परम धीम 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 the 
I am now. C. I am in now. Hearing. But don't lose this feeling of I am. yesterday we said attention is spiritual currency right we cannot walk the path without attention and now what is the meaning of the word identification identity See, attention going in will mean awareness, but everything depends on attention. And yesterday we saw that that attention has come from some divine source within us. It is the only connection to the inner divine, attention. And unless we can move back with this attention, layer upon layer, back to the source from which it came, it is only in that that we will realize that we are divine. So the whole journey is the movement of attention. Now, what is the meaning of the word identification? Can we live the same life we are living from morning to evening without getting identified anywhere? Be in a state of not being identified. And what is the characteristic, the lakshan? I am identified. You know, lakshan su. What is the characteristic? What is identification? Does it have to do with your personality? I have not come to the personality, okay. but I will write one more thing that you ask this question. Okay, now what is identity? And what is the characteristic that I am identified? What is the characteristic that I am identified? Supposing we take identification as hypnosis. 
Each moment in life, an event is coming to meet me in some form. And what is the characteristic that I am hypnotized to the event? There is a reaction. There is a reaction. And the reaction can only come from a state of mechanicalness, from a state of sleep. If there is a state of consciousness, then I am free of the reaction. The reaction drops. So, we will use this word identification. It is a word which Gurdjieff used. And the identification means I am in a state of sleep. Each moment in life there is a reaction. Reaction can be external, reaction can be internal. What is the immediate internal reaction? And as we move into the instinctive center, we will see that nature has put into, put, programmed us with this reaction each moment of our life. Because nature wants us to save our bodies, it wants us to run away from danger. So, in the immediate reaction to every situation in life, what is the immediate reaction? Either it, there is like or dislike. Either there is like or dislike. This is the immediate reaction. If I have become a victim of I like this or I don't like this. Right? Now I'm going to go back to something and then we'll go ahead. Yesterday there was a homework. <laughs> there was a homework. Having a thought, thinking a thought. What can we say about it? What can, and try to relate it to what we said yesterday. That is, outer event, inner state. Outer event, inner state. Now, let's go step by step. What is happening within us each moment of our lives? We want to study the science. And once we understand ourselves, that very understanding is going to bring, take us on the path of freedom. <clears throat> right? So, thinking a thought and having a thought. Supposing he has insulted me a few days ago and I see him again today and the thought comes that he has insulted me, right? And immediately I react inside to that thought and that, that is having a thought. The thought has come automatically. From that a negative state comes in. I don't like him, immediately there is dislike, a negative state, I move into a negative state and from that negative state I start thinking the thought, he had no right to do this, uh, what kind of person does he think he is, uh, he is this, he is that, can you understand this? He insulted me three days ago, I had the thought. Now, if I had brought consciousness over there, I would not uh, have allowed myself to become negative. I would have had the thought. It's okay to have thoughts. But the minute I became negative, I was, I was identified with that negative state. I was identified with that negative state. And that negative state now led me on a train of thinking, a chain of thinking. And there is a whole train of thoughts, all negative, all negative. Can you understand what I'm saying? Can you see how karma is born? Can you see that each of those thoughts, those negative thoughts become seeds for something else in the future? 
each of those negative thoughts, that whole train of thoughts. And in that moment, if I can bring in con consciousness, then I'm not so sowing a whole lot of seeds which is going to invite something negative in the future. I don't know whether I'm coming across in this. Okay? Just by one bringing in a little bit of consciousness, pausing in the moment, bringing a pause, my guru used to call it pause. Yeah. One statue. Mm -hmm. Statue. Statue. Statue in the body as we were children. Statue in the mind. Statue in the mind. I have the thought, but I'm stopping over there. I don't want to think the thought. Because in thinking the thought, I'm taking that negative state further. And with each thought that I have, which comes out of that negative state, I am sowing a seed for future suffering. Can you see the four noble truths of Buddha? There is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, that cause can be known and removed and if the cause is removed, pain which is yet to come can be avoided. Heyam nukham anagatam. So, thinking a thought and having a thought. It's okay to have thoughts. It's, it's very natural to have the thought that he insulted me. It's very natural. But can we pause there? Don't allow it to go further. Okay. <laughs> now we are back to attention. And we've, yeah. When you're having this barrage of thoughts coming through mm -hmm. and you're bringing consciousness at that point, mm -hmm. how does one stop that, you know, that flow of those negative things coming through because it just pushes and knocks on the door, it just keeps coming and even if you try, I think it's really hard. Definitely. It is very, very hard. <coughs> it's very, very hard. It's very simple but it's difficult. And uh, it takes many years of hard work. It's not something which we will, uh, what you call, master overnight. And there will be many intermittent stages. Like I go to cook a dish. Now, if the reaction is full, I throw it on you, then it's full cooking. But between the no cooking and the full cooking, there will be many intermittent stages. So, it, I may just be on the verge of saying it and I bring consciousness there. I feel it in my teeth, in my, what you call blood, and I bring consciousness there. So, it is where I introduce consciousness. And I may introduce consciousness after it has happened. The event is over, but suddenly I sit down. That in the last hour, where did I get identified? I just sit down and suddenly I see, oh, this happened and it happened in total darkness. Now can I bring light back to the situation? Nothing dies. There's nothing like the past. Because we are going to talk about the essence. Time is living. Right? So, when we say past, this happened in the past, it is just our, it is just our lower perception of time. But the past is now. The past is now. And in seeing it now, I am bringing about a change. Because in future when it is going to happen again, that very bringing of light is going to help me. Yep, what I'm trying to say. So, we can bring consciousness after the event. And this is, it's very beautifully said in the Mahabharata, where the, uh, you see there are two Gitas. One Gita is the one which Krishna told to Arjun. And the other Gita is the one which we have, which uh, Sanjay told to Dhrit. 
that lies somewhere else. You'll need a different ear to hear that. <laughs> right? So, the one which we have is a second hand copy. It is the one which Sanjay told to Dhritarash. And there was a uh, there was a gap of 10 days between it happening on the battlefield and Sanjay recounting it to Dhritarashtra. There was a gap of 10 days. And this is very, very symbolic in that the Gita starts with this gap of 10 days. It's very, very symbolic. Because initially I cannot bring consciousness when I am reacting. It's very difficult. I don't because reactions are emotional and when I start on the path of consciousness I am trying to bring it through the intellectual center you understand what I am trying to say and the intellect does not work at the speed of emotions it takes a, a long time to develop that intellect which can move at the same speed of emotions and here the like and dislike has happened in the heart it's too fast for the head to come in and it's going to take a lot of training, a lot of practice. But it can happen. It can happen. And <coughs> so initially we just go back. And the best time to do it is when we go to sleep at night. Go through the day. Don't leave the day unfinished. Then we, we finish all that nonsense in the dreams. We don't want to do that. Finish it off over there. If you can finish it off over there, then the dreams are of a different quality. So go through the day. Where did I lose consciousness in the day? Where did I react in the day? Which point? And just bring consciousness back to the situation. Please understand, if we judge the situation, we are again in identification. We don't want to judge, we want to look at the situation. Looking without judging. I don't want to judge whether it was bad for him to insult me, or it, and it was right for me to react. Can you understand? Then I've lost it. I've, I, uh, what do you call, uh, make the seed more powerful. So I don't want to bring any judgment. I just want to look at it and put a little light over there. A sick Chandmal, uh, you know, when he writes in Krishnamurti's biography, and Krishnamurti says that when I go to sleep at night, and Krishnamurti is a conscious person. He's, he says that when I start my day in the morning, the first thing I do in the morning is I go for a walk for five miles. And not a single thought passes through my consciousness when I am walking those five miles. Can you imagine that state? What a state to be in. He say, I go for a walk for five miles and not a single thought touches my consciousness in those five miles. And the same Krishnamurti is saying that just before going to sleep at night, I go through the events of the day once. Did I slip somewhere? And such a person who has reached that stage of state of consciousness, we call them as achyut. The one who cannot slip, we call Krishna as a chief. But still he is saying, I go back through the events of the day. Did I slip somewhere? Can we do this much? Just before going to sleep. Where, where did I react today? Where did I react today? <sighs> It's such a different state to be in when you're free of reaction. The perception of life changes. Then no situation in life can bring dislike. You are free of dislike. Dislike is the cause of all violence in the world. And if we can free ourselves of dislike, 
Can you just feel that state? You reach a state in life when you don't dislike anything. You may prefer this or not prefer this. You may prefer potatoes to brinjals, but you don't dislike brinjals. You understand what I'm trying to say? Preferences give joy in life, they add color to life. But dislike connects us. The minute we dislike anything, we are connected to our animal intensities. And suddenly this, you have given them a pathway to come up and they are all so violent. So, thinking a thought, having the thought, thinking the thought. Having the thought is like you're standing in your home near the, what do you call, uh, a doorway and you see the thought passing by. And thinking the thought, you've invited the thought into your home. Now you have to give it tea and you have a tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. And the karma is built. The karma is built. Having the thought does not create karma. Thinking the thought creates karma. You've sown a seed. Sati mule tat vipake jati ayu goga. Patanjali says. As long as the seed exists. Sati mule. As long as the seed exists. Tad vipake, it is going to fructify. Tad vipake, pak. And that fructifying is jati ayu bhoga. It is going to be of a certain type. If it is a seed of uh, wheat, then it will give rise to a wheat plant. And if it is a seed of something else, what seed was it? Was it? And it was the seed of dislike, what we call rahad dvesh, dislike. That seed, and it will, it will have a lifespan, jati, ayu, it will live that life, and bhoga, you will have to experience it. Can you see? So, <clears throat> try to, just in small situations in life, bring in consciousness, like he said, statue. I think in one of these days, I'll repeat that whole lecture of statue. That whole talk we had of Adam's statue. I'll take Patanjali sutras also, beautiful sutras on statue. Right. Okay, now we go back to attention, identification, and what is the characteristic of identification? The relationship of attention to identification and the characteristic. I just told, told it to you. What is the characteristic of identification? And we are going to write one more word. Attention is my currency, my money. What we call my capital. Right? And I want to go on this inward journey and to move on that inward journey. If I want to travel to Kashmir or someplace, I do need money to buy the ticket and whatever. So, <clears throat> similarly, the money I need to move in is attention. <clears throat> and the quality of, I'm very sorry to say, the quality of our attention. <clears throat> okay. Now, <clears throat> this attention, this money of mine, it's stuck everywhere, it's invested everywhere. And I don't have enough of money to buy my ticket, <clears throat> to sit in the bus, to sit in the plane, to sit. <clears throat> and where is it stuck? And what is the characteristic that it is stuck? In a lakshas. In a lakshas. What is the characteristic that it is stuck? 
What is the characteristic? That my attention is stuck. Our pain real? <laughs> is any of our pain real? Or is it all imaginary? It's all imaginary. Is there anything like real pain? I'm not talking about physical pain, I had an accident or something. Identification with the body, we are not talking about identification with the body. That goes under Hatha Yoga, we are not talking about Hatha Yoga. Hmm? Definitely, if I cut my finger, I'll feel pain. Right. <clears throat> is any of our pain real? Or is it all imaginary? What is the re only real pain, which should be there in everyone, which is not there? <laughs> the real suffering. What is the real suffering, which should be there in everyone? Why am I? Suffering. Suffering. Why am I? Suffering. Why is there still pain? Now, try to relate pain to attention, because these are all English words we are using in Gujarati. It is much easier to understand. Our attention, jeev, varo jeev, chote lo che lo lakshan so. Varo jeev, chote lo che lo lakshan so. My attention is stuck somewhere. What is the characteristic? What is the characteristic? Bolo it. Gujarati, you already understood. What is it? A Gujarati, they know what was. Maro jeev chote no che no lakshan so. Apan Gujarati shab dwakro ne. Duk. No, duk ne. Jeev bada. That is not right. Absolutely right. But not the one I want. Apan kuro jeev bada. Jeev bada che. Maro jeev bada che. And you see, where all do I feel pain? and related to attention. I have bought a new car. Is my money with me or is it invested in the car? Just try to see this. The attention is not with me. I want to go on the journey. It is stuck in the car. Because if somebody breaks the glass of the car, the car is not going to feel pain. I am going to feel pain. Maro jeev badwa noche. Right? Supposing I have bought a new house. Now, now at least the, there is something like the car. Right? There is an entity called the car and uh, maybe one the child going to school, he made a scratch on the car and I felt pain. Okay, that is something. And I bought a new house. And somebody criticizes the house I bought. <laughs> Do I feel pain? Do I feel pain? Now, nobody's made a scratch on the house. <laughs> they made a scratch on the picture of the house I had in my mind. <laughs> Can you see how pain is so elusive? But what does it mean? My attention is not just stuck in the house, but it is also stuck in the picture I have of the house. The mental picture I have of the house. Somebody just criticizing that house and Maharaji Bharaj, I feel pain. And make a list. Make a list in life. It's very important. Kya kya jeev bade 
make a list where all am I stuck where all is my attention stuck please make a list in the physical world where is it stuck in my things in my bank balance in my this in my that whatever in the emotional things in my son in my wife in my relatives in my friends can you understand this my attention is stuck everywhere uh, somebody tells me this friend of yours was saying this about you right pain So it is stuck in the physical universe, it is stuck in the molecular universe in relationships, Gu Bhuva. It is stuck in the mental universe of thoughts. I have thoughts about religion, I have thoughts about clothes, I have thoughts about caste, I have thoughts about all kinds of things, and I'm stuck. You know, we've met, met after 20 years of teaching. And in the old days, you know, when the inner experiences, the inner vision, they are new. You're in this state of you want to conquer the world, you know. <laughs> and one of the contradictions which I used to see was that I go to a guru to be free. Mm. I go to the guru to be free. And my attention gets stuck in the guru. Mm. Now I went there to learn the technique of freeing my attention. I went to him to learn the technique of freeing my attention and he got stuck in it. I, I criticize your guru, are you going to feel pain? Hmm. I criticize your god, are you going to feel pain? So that if you are going to pray to the god, you are going with that, that please show me the pathway to free my attention. Hmm. But I criticize that you feel pain. The attention is stuck in the god, it is stuck in the religion, it is stuck in the guru. There is a relationship between the guru and disciple. It's a beautiful relationship. But it has to break at some time. It has to get over at some time. I used to enjoy doing the small things for my guru. Going and buying his things, taking his things to the laundry, you know. And it was such a joy. And those sensitivities which I have, you know, in a part of my memory, they are beautiful, they are so alive today also. Just watching him do the small things in life. Even when we used to go from his flat, he used to live on the sixth floor and we would go down. I would make it a point that I don't go down the stairs before him. So I could just observe the way he would walk down the stairs. And then it was a song. But the thing is not to get attached to it. All those sensitivities, they bring so much of joy. But they can also bring depression. Or right, he's gone away and what will I do with him? Then the attention is stuck. The attention is stuck. So, we want to move on this inner journey and the first thing is freeing of attention. Freeing of attention is what we call as Vairagya, renunciation. Renunciation does not leave, mean leave this. Does not mean leave your car, leave your home, leave your wife, wear orange clothes, go to ashram. <laughs> it does not mean anything. It means live with the wife without your attention stuck in her. Live with the son without being identified. It's very easy to live in an ashram and say, I'm not identified. 
very very easy. Me because I live in Anasha. Right. Okay. <laughs> but that is the beauty to be so totally involved with your children and not to be identified, not to be attached. To know that they have come with their own destiny. You cannot change their destiny. So I didn't want I want to write that one more word, renunciation. Renunciation, we will at present the meaning of renunciation is freeing of attention. Free it from everything. Don't leave your bank balance. But use your bank balance diligently. Use it without getting involved with it. Live in a beautiful house. Enjoy your home. Enjoy your bedroom. Whatever it is. Don't get involved with it. Free your attention. And this living in everything and still keeping your attention free. That is renunciation. Abhyasa, Vairagya, Vyama, Tanni, Rodha. Patanjali state says, what is the way to reach that state? That to reach that state is through Abhyas, hard work and Vairagya, renunciation. Hard work and renunciation. Hard work is not allowing the attention to be stuck again anywhere else. And renunciation, wherever it is stuck, take it back from there. I want my money in my hand, cash it, I want to encash all my capital so it's in my hand because I want to use it for this inner journey, attention and that is why attention is so important. I'm just going to add one more thing over here and then we'll move ahead into a sense personality and false personality. Like we said, humans are the only species where attention can go out and it can go in. Can we divide our attention? Can we divide our attention? One arrow of attention talking to you, one arrow of attention within my self. Am I talking to you? But what is my inner state? And I'm, uh, am I aware of both these of these together? You can't see inside of me. You don't know my inner state. I can't see your inner states as I see a piece of furniture. But are we aware of our inner state? And for that, attention has to go inside. So we have to divide the attention when we are living. One arrow of attention is on the event in life. This is the beginning, that is called Radhe. One arrow of attention is on my inner reaction to that event. What state am I in at this moment? I was expecting to win the lottery, but I didn't win the lottery. What state am I in? at that time. Outer event, inner state and both together. This is the beginning. This inner state is Krishna. Outer event is Radha. This is the journey of Bhakti, Radha Krishna. 
double arrow attention. And it must start from this very, very ground level. Now, before we go further, I want to make a division over here. How much of attention inside and how much of attention outside? How much of attention inside? How much of attention outside? I'm talking to you, how much of attention should be on talking to you and how much of attention on what is happening within me. <clears throat> there must be a perfect division. We want only 10% inside, 90% outside. What happens when we sit in meditation? What happens when we sit in meditation or do some breathing meditation? I don't know, there's so much in the market, Chris. <laughs> right? All 100% goes in. We become useless for life. You see all the meditators, they are useless for life. They can't live a normal life. Uh, they can't go for the new movie. What is the new movie? PK or something. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because they are doing meditation. That's well below them. Too. Right? So, we don't want all 100% to go in. We want only 10% to go in. And very luckily I realized this at a very, very early time in my journey and for that I am very, very grateful to again the same American Guru E.J. Gold. Why do we want only 10% insight? Why do we want only 10% insight? The minute the inner psyche becomes aware that something is observing it, it will change. If he has insulted me and I see him and the reaction is coming out, if I take more than 10% in attention inside, the reaction will subside, it will go and hide away somewhere. And I'll be in a state of meditation, such beautiful bliss, no reaction. <coughs> and I'm not free of that reaction. And you understand what I'm trying to say? So, we want to have this division proper that only 10% goes inside and it's just far away watching whatever comes up and slowly things will start happening. This thing is what in the Shastra is called as Sudarshan, right observation. That is why we say that Krishna's weapon is only that of observing, not of that of fighting. Sudarshan, right observation. Am I observing rightly? Now, what is the easiest way of making this ratio 10% and 90%? What is the easiest way? Practice. Practice. The rhythmic breathing. Use the rhythm. Because you are doing all your daily activities, the music is on very softly somewhere and as and when you remember you will be breathing with the music and the, automatically the attention will divide into the proper ratio 90-10. Once you have that ratio, then you don't need the music so much. You just have to polish it now and again and you start the process of inner observation. 
90% on life, 10% inside on the reaction. Then you will move one step further. 90% on the reaction, 10% of what caused this reaction. Now, Radha has changed, exchanged places with Krishna and Krishna has exchanged places with Radha. Krishna has gone deeper. And as you go layer by layer, one day the attention will fall on the source of attention, the real Krishna inside. And this is the journey. So, uh, try to divide the attention in this way. Now, if our attention is divided in this way, what happens to the quality of our life? What happens to the quality of our life? Just imagine. Uh, Ramdulare Bapu used to say, Jeevan ko umra se bhar dene ki bajaye, ab umra ko jeevan se bhar do. These are all these one liners so used to have. Uh, that fill your life not with years, but fill your life with life. Not with years. Right? So, what happens now? Suddenly, I am in this state of divided attention. What is happening? What is the qual what happens to the quality of life? The quality of life. What happens? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. It improves. Huh? It improves. Yes, but because your attention is. Yeah. Uh, at the event, so you don't react to events because your attention is there to stop you from reacting. Supposing I'm saying enjoying something in life, maybe I'm enjoying a good cup of tea, right? Now, if I'm daydreaming, then I'm not even enjoying the tea, or if I'm brooding, he insulted me three days ago, brooding, <laughs> then I'm not definitely not in, enjoying the. Now, if I'm enjoying the tea, then I'm really in, you know, with the tea. But if I'm in divided attention, I'm enjoying the tea and what else? <coughs> what else? What else? You know, peace. I'm enjoying the I which is drinking the tea. tea. Can you see, if I'm just enjoying the tea, I'm taking in one feeling. But here I am taking in the feeling of T and I am taking in the feeling of I, I drinking T. I am taking in two feelings. Can you understand what I am trying to say? The, the, the quality of life is double. Can you, in, in what other people are living in one year, supposing somebody is doing this. I am not saying I am doing this. But if somebody is doing this, then in that one year, what other people may be living, and because other people are daydreaming all the time, they're not even living, right? <clears throat> but supposing they are in that present moment, the person who is taking in the feeling of I, he is living double what they are living. From each moment, he is extracting something more. That is why we call Krishna as Makhan Chor. From each moment of life, he extracts. The butter of life. And the butter of life is not in the feeling of the tea. The butter of life is in the feeling of I, consciousness. Can you see this? Now, you see, people go and they do so many pujas and so many prayers and So many things they do. Can it really have an effect, or can it only have an effect when it is doubled? Now, supposing I'm listening to some mantras or something. And I am sensing the feeling of those mantras. 
supposing I have a knowledge of Sanskrit and the intellectual center will also be enjoying certain meanings of those mantras in the uh, what you call instinctive center there will be a sensation of the vibration of the mantras if there is an inner uh, if there is an inner understanding of the meaning of the mantra maybe some emotion will also be attached to that but that is one side of the thing if at the same time that I am reciting the mantra or hearing the mantra if I am taking in the feeling of I at the same time does the potency of the mantra double or maybe not just double 10 or 100 times more <laughs> This is what I am trying to ask you. Can you see the effect of this? I go to do a prayer somewhere, maybe I am reciting some slokas or something of that sort. And if I am in the state of double arrow attention, then one is I am enjoying those slokas and I could be enjoying it with different centers, the thinking center, the emotional center, the instinctive center. I may be doing some mudras, the moving center. All these centers are involved and somewhere there is consciousness, the feeling of I reciting mantra and does the power of the mantra multiply manifold? Can you get what I am trying to say? I am going to repeat something which we did last year and then I will go to today's subject. When we talk about consciousness, let us try to understand the four levels of consciousness. The lowest level is what is called as sleep. Sushupti. Sleep. The next level is dream. Swapna. The next level is <clears throat> awakening. Jagrati. And the final level is objective consciousness or seeing the truth in everything. Truth. Now where are we in these four? Where are we? We spend all 24 hours in this state. <clears throat> Every event of life hypnotizes us. Every event of life hypnotizes us. I have reacted to him, I am hypnotized by my anger, the negative state inside. I may, we all imagine that we are in a state of consciousness. We we'll live in this imaginary state that we are conscious beings, we know what we are doing. But if we can really see a little inside, we are living in a dream all 24 hours. Maybe sometimes we go into deep sleep which is becoming more and more rare in today's world. <clears throat> right? Is this clear to everyone? This much? Now, when I am praying, when I am reciting a mantra, I am reciting a slok, I am asking for some kind of grace to fall upon me. I am opening my vessel. I am creating a kind of inner synchronicity through the vibrations. And in that I want to become an open vessel for something from higher to come into me. Something from the higher. Uh, definitely not a lottery ticket. Right? <laughs> Higher can only come from this state. It can only come from this state. 
but this state can only give to this state it cannot give to this state and we are here so if we really want some kind of help if we want our prayers to be answered right then we have to come to this state because the prayers can only be answered from this state and this state can only connect to this state of awakening jagrati and the characteristic of this state is self consciousness i am drinking the tea and i am aware of myself drinking the tea double arrowed attention this is the characteristic of this state and once i am in this state i am open for grace to come from a higher state help will come every moment of my life then i don't have to go looking for the guru wherever i am if i am in this state he has to come looking for me the guru finds the disciple the disciple can never find the guru because the disciple is living in this state what guru is he going to find <laughs> it's not possible can you understand what i'm trying to say it just be a creation of his dream world right so this is my i have to make myself deserving and the only luck layak ban wo pade and the only way is to come to a state of double arrowed attention right okay i think this gives us some background why double arrow attention is so important later i'll go very deep into what is attention we go back to where we started day before yesterday right something yeah i just need to yeah please 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 i just needed to clarify something you know we we talked about attention all the time but there is a thing called awareness which is almost synonymous to attention but it's not the same thing. or is it is it is it what is it suppose i am aware of this how am i aware of this only by throwing attention, attention on this on this right so without <coughs> attention there cannot be awareness to be self aware i have to take attention inside consciousness is not this consciousness is that which can watch this can you understand what i am trying to say so awareness is not consciousness i am aware that i am angry and i am trying to work with that anger but i am not conscious of my anger as yet i am not separated from it there is not something which is watching rajan getting angry and you see what i'm trying to say but rajan is in the state rajan is aware that he is angry and that is because he has taken his attention in and he is trying to throw the attention on that anger that brings about a state of self awareness but at one point there will be total separation and that separation is consciousness it is consciousness which watches awareness and consciousness does not know how to do anything else except to see the atma knows only how to see it cannot do for doing it has to create a new instrument called the ego karta aham karoti ahankaram ne okay so instead of thinking just start seeing watching <laughs> that's it that's it we've got it okay i'm going to write now two more words on the board before going into this <laughs> i hope this is very clear the value of double arrow attention in anything we are doing even you come to the mandir you are bowing before the idol is there feeling of i bowing to the then the whole quality changes 
the whole quality changes. You know, I've been very, very lucky in a way because my Guru Taurya side was so scientific in his approach to everything. There was nothing like any puja or anything. It was just a scientific approach to spirituality. And from 1975 to 1982, I was with Ramdula Rebappu and he was my Guru. I met Taurya side in 1988. And Ram Dullare Bapu used to do all the pujas and he would do them so beautifully and he built in the ashram, he built this temple of Santoshi Ma and he used to do all these things and I was, when I met him I was still in my junior year of college there was still two more years of college left and studying in Bombay and it was very difficult for me to except that somebody would do these kinds of pujas and this but the way he used to do it there was such a beautiful playfulness about it there was a, a different quality the way he used to do it and so that came with me and then when I was with Tawariya side those six years he went into the science of everything and suddenly the science of all the rituals which we are doing they started opening up and then I had this with me, the, his playfulness in doing it, the science over here and as we move on the path of consciousness, you know, and then a sudden inner kind of amalgamation came, everything came together that in doing the puja, the feeling of I and the science of the puja, it's not some hocus pocus. <laughs> but definitely when I first met uh, Ram Dulare Bapu, I used to think it was really all hocus pocus. Huh? So I didn't go through that. <laughs> so, but there is such a deep science behind all the rituals. But if in the end, if they don't lead to feeling of I, then they have not served their purpose. <clears throat> These two words, knowledge and being. Because now I want to talk about being. Knowledge and being. What is the difference between knowledge and being? Knowledge is to understand being. <laughs> knowledge, I think, is to understand. Being is to feel and being mm -hmm. and loving. Right. Supposing we have a knowledge that there is an outer event and inner state. Then how does this knowledge relate to my being? How does this knowledge relate to my being? First comes what you said? Understanding. understanding. First will come intellectual understanding. Right? And then how will I start relating it to my being? I will start implementing the knowledge. I will start putting it into practice. And in putting it into practice, I will start being free of my negative states. And by using the knowledge, I have changed my level of being. Can you understand what I am trying to say? Knowledge and being must move together. Many people have a lot of knowledge. But when you observe their daily living, it is the same reactions. It is the same negativity. You see, it's so, sometimes it's very difficult for me to say also, but in the last 20 years, I have been invited to nearly every ashram in India to teach these exercises. And 
It's so disturbing when you see that these gurus of ours, they are so full of negativity. They are jealous of the other guru. They are so full of anger. How many people went in his lecture? And I don't know if any of you have been in the Kumbh Melas. <laughs> and I spent one month with Ramdulare Bapu in the 1977 Kumbh Mela in uh, Allah. And uh, Ramdulare Bapu was so well respected by all the sadhus in India. And he used to be called to everybody's head. I used to observe all these people over there. And there would be what you call, you know, these special chamchas. Beautiful people. I love the chamchas, born in the good. <laughs> and they would come to one guru and they would say, Uske to wo havan. This fellow had a havan and he had so many yagnas over there and so many people came to attend. But when you did it, nobody came in your list. And you observe the face of the guru. Right? And this is the state. They have so much of knowledge and no being. No being. If you don't implement the knowledge, what is the point? So, knowledge and being must move together. If I take that knowledge and I don't implement it at one time, I will imagine that I have implemented it. And then there is no possibility for change whatsoever, no possibility for transformation. I become an irreparable machine. Then this life has gone. Nothing can change in this life. So the knowledge has to be implemented. A scientist has a lot of knowledge. But there's so much of competition going on. And he wants to publish his thesis before somebody else has published the same thesis. The being is the same. There's nothing, with all his knowledge, nothing changes in the being of the person. Our whole journey is the journey of being. It is not the journey of knowledge. We use the knowledge to rise in being. Being is a ladder. And as we use and implement the knowledge, we rise in this ladder of our being to higher and higher levels of consciousness. And I remember Taurya Sahib used to keep on telling me, don't let your knowledge get two years ahead of your being. If your knowledge is more than two years, just wait. Try to reach that level of knowledge, then try get more knowledge. But let your be give your being a chance because the being is slow. Implementation of the knowledge is slow. It takes time. We have to practice it in our daily living. And we have to allow time for the being. Now, what is being? Let us get knowledge of what is being. <laughs> being is made of three parts. We will term these parts as essence, personality, false personality.
Essence is our real side. Personality is our acquired side. False personality is our imaginary side. These three things make up our being. Something which is real. The real acquires something. It acquires a skin. It acquires clothes. It acquires a training. Right? And something which is imagined. Essence is that which we were before birth. The essence seeks to take a human form because the essence wants to perfect itself. It comes in the school of life and in the school of life it wants to eat a certain food and in eating that food it grows. Now to come into the school of life, it cannot come just like that, so it has to seek a mother and father to come into a physical form. And so it seeks a mother and father, it borrows a set of DNA from the mother, it borrows a set of DNA from the father. Please understand this. because. When we move deeper into these practices, when we move, we want to bypass DNA. Ram Dulare Bapu had a beautiful saying, Sab kuch niyojit hai, phir bhi uska ayojan karna padta hai. Everything is destined, but still you have to make an effort for it to express it. What does he mean? What does he mean? Let us try to understand this because we go further in this. The essence it manifests through the DNA, two sets of DNA. It comes into a physical form through these two sets of DNA. Now, the essence may have thousands and thousands of potentialities lying in the essence. But the DNA may be a limiting factor. The DNA may be a limiting factor that it, out of those thousands of possibilities, which are lying in the essence, only so much can be expressed because the, that essence has to express through the mother and father and the mother and father becoming a li become a limiting factor. You see, the physical form will follow the DNA. Right? The physical form will not fo follow what kind of essence it is, even though it is hidden there. And we can see it in the statues of Khajurao. The temples, the old Indian temples. Supposing somebody was to see my face. Supposing an old friend of my father's, he was to see my see me, meet me for the first time, what would he say? You look like your father. So he is now looking at the DNA, right? But in the face, is there some kind of essence also? Can you understand? Supposing say the temples of Khajura, I spent a week in Khajura also, you know, just studying those temples. Now, each of these statues, they are telling us a story. Now, 
supposing the face is a little puffed up like this, right? It could still look like my father, but what would you say? You would say that the influence of Jupiter is more. But say if the face is a little long like this, you would say the influence of the moon is little more. Okay. Am I coming across? So the DNA is a limiting factor for the essence, but still behind the, S the DNA is the essence and the essence has, is not of the earth, it has come from the stars, it has come from the planets. It is made of planetary material. Or say there is one apsara, a statue of one apsara and you are observing the thigh of the apsara. So if the thigh is short, you will say the influence of mercury is more. Can you get what I am trying to say? But the, the thigh is very well shaped, you will say the influence of Venus is more. So behind these statues in these temples, the, uh, the because these sculptures they were not, they came from certain inner ashrams. They were, it was not done by like the temples of today are built. There is no science in today's temple. The science is totally lost and the art which is now there is just the art of beauty make one sta statue of Hanuman and make one statue of this and make one statue of that and make a khichdi and get them all together <laughs> and no one wants to explain the science of anything so Within the DNA is the, behind the DNA is the essence, but the essence has thousands and thousands of potentialities. But because of my mother and father, I only so much could be expressed. But if we bring in consciousness, we can bypass our heredity and work with the essence directly. That is why we bring in consciousness. Day before yesterday I repeated that for the birth of an essence, for the essence to come into a physical form, death on a very very large scale is needed. It is only the energy of death which allows the essence to manifest and that is why thousands, I'm sorry, millions and millions of sperm have to die for that one essence to be manifest. Only one sperm reaches. Which one did I open? This one. Now this, yeah. Why does it have to have millions of, uh, why do you have to have death for an essence to manifest? Does it have to be death for manifestation from a whole source? Is the energy is the energy of sex the energy of death? Has to be. Has to be. Right? Every uh, every month a woman sheds how many cell uh, uh, eggs? They all die. Right? In one expression of sex, the man. So sheds how many cells, how many sperms, they all die. It is, it is like an atom bomb, right? millions and millions are dying. Right? It is death on a very mass scale. And it is this energy of death on a very mass scale which allows the essence which is in an, in an invisible dimension of time and space to come into a visible dimension of time and space. Something in the lower world has to die for that to happen. And later on as we study personality and we study how the real eye moves from the personality into the essence 
we will see that many in the personality have to die. Only then can they move in. And if you study the Mahabharata, the thousands and thousands died. Oh, if you study those, the description which the Rishi Vyas has written of the battle, you won't be able to eat your food. How he and and he's you know swinging the pendulum from this part to this part, and he's say that there are thousands of these horses and their blood coming out and people with their heads chopped off and their blood coming out and the, every, all the soldiers are putting their feet in the blood and it is mixing with the mud and it's like rain has fallen and all this is together, this mess is and then he'll say, also say how it is looking so beautiful also. <laughs> and he has written this. He has written this. Can you see? He's talking about in that one 18 days of battle, he's talking about death on a very mass scale. Unimaginable. Unimaginable. And in, in that, uh, what do you call, that description of that death, he's giving us the deepest secrets of life. But he's just tailored it in. And if you see in the Mahabharata that even after the battle was over, uh, the whole Panchal army was still there. And in the middle of the night, Ashwatthama, he took on a terrible form as a monster. And he describes that form over there. And how he massacres, alone he massacres this whole army. <laughs> And all of Draupadi's children, her brothers, and how it is done. Because in that final, in that final experience of truth, when that which is lower merges into the higher, everything else has to die. Within our own psychic nature. And we will understand that science in the next few days. We are going to go into that. It has to die. And that is why it is such a beautiful Shastra, the way he has written it. Uh, what I am trying to give you is in a scientific form, a scientific form, you know, in a step by step way of how we can implement it in our lives. What he has written is a piece of poetry supreme. I don't think there can ever be a person like him again. It's impossible to imagine how a person could have written this. This one book. It's impossible to imagine. And that is why the story goes that the minute he was born, and it's a beautiful story of his birth, that this Rishi Parashar he was crossing the Ganga in this boat and this boat woman who is taking him across, she's a young girl and suddenly at that moment he sees that all the planets are in their perfectly, degreeally perfect state of exaltation. Can you understand that supposing we say Jupiter is exalted in what you call Cancer but at exactly 8 degrees, then 8 degrees. If Mars is exalted in say Capricorn at 28 degrees, then exactly 28 degrees. This is, I don't know in how many combinations this such a combination can ever be possible. Can you understand what I'm trying to say? And the Rishi suddenly sees that this moment, because the moon is moving very fast in all the planets, and it is going to lose its degrically state of exaltation. Right? 
See, even in Krishna's birth chart, one planet is in a state of exaltation. He was born under Rohini Nakshatra. The moon was in a state of exaltation. And here the Rishi Parashar is seeing that all the planets are in their highest state. Something which may have happened once and may never happen again. And he says, the only person in front of me is this girl. If I plant a seed in her, the child which will be born will be a child of a different quality. And he uh, planted the seed in her and the child is Vyas. Whether this is true or not is a different thing. But when we symbolically look at it, that uh, there is a certain the, there is a state where the essence has reached a degree of perfection because the essence is planetary and that symbolic person is Vyas and he is writing this Shastra and it is said he was born he immediately grew up into being a young child there was no nine months or anything and he just walked off into the forest and he sat in Sadhana and <laughs> sat in the meditation and he wrote this and it the whole thing is the story of the essence, the story of the essence, right? how the essence can reach that level of perfection and he has hidden that in this and it is because of today's science, because today we have a language of science, 50 years ago, 100 years ago we did not have that language, so then we had to understand everything in stories and in slokes and things like that. But today, now we can unravel everything in today's language. Right? We don't have to go back to those stories. Those stories are very nice and interesting. And from those stories, we can take out. Because today, science has given us a perfect language, a perfect way of understanding it, which would not have been possible previously. So, the essence that whole essence for it to be born death happens on a very mass scale right? oh I do wish I do wish it is by not that in these few years that we are together you experience how to die and come back out of death this becomes your inner experience you master the energy of death This is the only thing which I cannot give it to you, I can only teach you the way. And that is all this is about. If we can understand that one energy, the energy of death, we have understood the deepest mystery of life. <laughs> so the essence wants to grow in the school of life and for that it needs a special kind of food. It takes on a body. The body grows on physical food. To a certain extent it grows on physical food and then it maintains itself by physical food. The essence does not grow on physical food. The essence grows on psychological food. For the essence to grow, it needs a personality. <coughs> the essence forms a personality. And then it eats this personality. The personality dies. The personality dies, the person, essence eats this personality and grows. <clears throat> but it cannot grow without first forming a personality. You can't keep the child in some ashram from his young age and say we don't want any personality to grow. Let him be in the jungle or something or that. So, right? It's good in the old stories. <laughs> It's not possible. It has to form up and the richer the personality, the better. I'll just stop at one last point. We'll uh, think about it and then continue tomorrow.
the personality is our acquired side where does the personality start what is the beginning of personality the name the name the name the, name. the beginning of the personality the center of gravity of the personality is the name now what can we say of the feeling of i when the child is born he is only a essence so when he has a feeling of i i hungry it is the feeling of the essence then we change tell the child your name is this your name is and he starts responding to the name the feeling of i shifts from the essence to the personality now when you call the child his name he will respond to that name he has forgotten this feeling of i his whole life he he lives an illusion we have forgotten the real feeling of i what is i am i getting across in this and this is where we want to go back to right so we'll stop over here continue tomorrow thank you you all listen very very attentively <laughs> right all this which i am talking about i know it is very difficult very difficult and the very fact that so many of you are interested is something i am very thankful thank you uh, it was grace we meet again tomorrow uh, good night jesh sir you can sawar hapa se 6:30 in the morning we do the tomorrow is the phase x phase x phase x
it comes from somewhere very deep within him. It comes from some place very real within him. As he is given a name and we start calling him by the name, this feeling of I leaves the essence and is the, his center of gravity, the center of gravity of his consciousness moves into the personality. The personality is like a skin which covers the essence. It is a tightly fitting skin. It comes from the Greek word persona, meaning a mask. Now, just let us try to understand what happens. In the essence, is real I. In the personality, what will we call this I? That which is not real. Ego. That which is not real. Ego. Hmm? Ego. But Ego. Ego. Uh, we we'll try to not use those words. We we'll try not to use those words because people have so many associations related to those words. They've heard them such a lot. They've read about them such a lot. So we we'll try to use a different terminology. Hmm? Right. What could we call this I? False. False or imaginary eye. Mm -hmm. huh? We'll call it the imaginary eye. So when every time somebody calls my name, is it the real I? No. The feeling I get of I, I Rajin, right, can never be real. And the feeling of real I has been lost somewhere. Can you see our whole life? Everything is false. Now, this comes with name. This comes with name. Everything which is done in life is done by the name. Who gets the degrees? Does the essence get the degrees or does the name get the degrees? The name gets the degrees. Who marries? Does the essence marry or does the name marry? The name marries. Can you see? Everything goes to the name, nothing goes to the essence. And we start on a journey and from this personality something more is formed which we will go into later on. Now let us try to just understand what this personality is and let us try to go into the very deep into this feeling of I because this is what the whole journey is about. Can I have my original feeling of I? Now in the personality, we perform all the roles of life. So, I am born as a son, so I am performing the role of a son. I go to school, I am performing the role of a student. These are each of the personas, the masks, which I start wearing in this personality. There are so many of them, so many of them. Every moment in life, I am in some role. 
and that role is a part of personality. When we start taking our attention inside, it is we have to see what relative I am I in just now. In school, I may be chosen in some team, maybe I am chosen in the football team. I am now playing the role of a footballer, one more role. Can you see how the personality is like a stage in which every moment we are acting some role. And it is these collection of roles, these collections of this collection of masks that we call our personality. Now when we go into the centers, we will go into how these masks come about because they start in the child with imitation. Right? But we won't take that now. Now, supposing I join the football team in school and I now have a feeling of I footballer right I have this feeling of I football but suddenly I win some prize maybe I have scored some goal or something of that sort and I win some prize what do I create what do I create what do I create yes the false personality but how is it created what do I create Do I create a picture of myself as a footballer? Do I create a picture? Now, this picture has been created out of what? Out of what? Imagination. Imagination. At least as a footballer, there was some relative truth to what I was doing. I was playing a relative role in life. But this picture I have of myself, do I fall in love with this picture? Tell me. Tell me. Because if somebody criticizes the picture, if somebody criticizes the picture, do I feel hurt? Somebody says, of course you scored the goal, but it was very easy and there were no good players in front of you. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so do I feel hurt? Right? And please remember the real cannot feel hurt. If I am feeling hurt, I am in the wrong somewhere. I am in the false, whatever. So this picture I have of myself as a footballer has it taken me even further away from my essence? Yeah. Because now I'm not having the feeling of I of a footballer, I'm having a fe the feeling of I huh? of my picture as a footballer. Right? You'll praise me and that feeling of I all of us have experienced this when somebody praises us what is the feeling of I it's totally false it's totally false enjoy it for a moment drop it immediately <laughs> so out of this falling in love with the picture what is created What 
what is created. What is created? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Our whole center of gravity is self love. And the whole journey is if we can dissolve this, what remains? Love. You don't have to do anything for love. love. It's all nonsense. Love him and love that and love this. Don't do anything for love. Do for dissolving the self. Hmm. Love is already there. It's only in the wrong direction. Can you understand what I'm trying to say? Without dissolving self, there can be no love. love. There can be attraction and repulsion. And there can be like and dislike. Try to observe self-love. When somebody criticizes me, it's my self-love which is hurt. When somebody does not keep an appointment, it is my self-love which is hurt. When somebody has parked his car in front of me, it is my self-love which is hurt. We are just a bundle of self-love and nothing else. When we talk, we only talk about ourselves. We only sing our song. Oh, I can keep on talking and talking about self-love. And observe this self-love. It is, it is so fleeting. It is, the, the, you go to observe it, it will change its form. That is why I don't use the word ego anywhere. Two people are talking in the corner. Uh, we feel they are talking about me. And if they are laughing, they are definitely talking about me. <laughs> right? Self-love. Self-love always is right. It can never be wrong. Try to see when we are having a conversation with somebody, how self-love comes in. Observe other people having conversations, not to tell, judge them, but to observe our own self-love. Because you will see that people immediately take the opposite stance. Nobody has a conversation. Somebody says something, somebody immediately says the opposite. He has to say it because that gives him a feeling of self. The self-love. Somebody says, uh, yesterday I went on a picnic. He's not bothered about that. He's saying five years ago I went on a picnic. <laughs> so every moment is self-love. Every moment it is self-love. Every impulse which comes in from our five senses, every event in life, it first comes and hits on our self-love. We color that event through our self-love. We must understand this if we want to be free of self. Free of self. To go back to the real I. So, in essence, there is real I. Essence needs a personality. It needs a personality and the minute the name comes, an imaginary I comes in. And that imaginary I forms a self-image. We all have a self-image. Don't you know who I am? Huh? We all have a self-image. Right? And we fall in love with our own image. Don't for one moment Think that you fall in love with somebody else. Uh, for that fraction of a second we experience love. Then self comes in. I possess her. Can you understand what I am trying to say? Gone. That beautiful experience of love which came for a fraction of a second is over. Right. And everything else in life is self love. So, 
there is a real the essence essence forms a personality the personality has an imaginary i from that imaginary i we have an image of ourselves and we have fallen in love with our own reflection in the mirror and it's very easy to observe self love in other people do it please do observe it in other people but do it huh, so that we can observe it in our selves right now <clears throat> Now from personality we form something called false personality. And this false personality is full of pictures. in the personality i am playing the role of say a footballer of course i am not a footballer but whatever hmm? right and i have a picture of myself as a footballer and somebody criticizes that picture they are not criticizing me they are criticizing the picture i have i feel hurt what do i do what do i want to do what do i want to do do i want to save my picture at all costs right my picture i want to save at all costs so i defend my picture right i justify my picture see that you will later see that there are a lot of lawyers inside us right and they immediately come for defense huh and they say nay nay huh you just see tomorrow i'll score a better goal right and the picture is saved out of this picture the false personality becomes powerful can you see the feeling i am having of i is not of personality not the role i'm playing this has gone very very far away it is now totally imaginary my feeling of i is totally imaginary in my personality i am feeling i am playing the role of a father right of course four to six months of the year i am traveling so it's very easy for somebody to come and tell me that you are a useless father right now in the personality i am playing the role of a father so i have a picture of myself as a father that picture is totally imaginary right but somebody says you are a useless father hmm and i feel hurt now i can you see i am feeling hurt because the false has been broken huh i have attached a value a share price to this picture huh i have attached some stock market price to this picture and somebody has quoted a lower price right i feel hurt i'll defend myself i'll justify i'll defend myself right i may defend myself in some other way hmm? i may boast about all the good i have done in the world right so all i am doing is making the false personality more and more power and with every role that i play in my personality i have a picture can you see you're driving a car you're playing the role of a driver but somebody comes in like this and you get upset suddenly in that getting upset are you feeling the role of a driver or something totally imaginary you are saying he does not know how to drive drive you made a picture of him can you see and you judged that picture of him totally imaginary and in that getting in that irritation in that getting angry on him 
I am so far away from the real I. So far away. In the totally false. And from here to come over here. This is our journey. And it has to happen in the small things in life. Huh? I may be me uh, meditating. <laughs> Every morning I may be meditating and uh, my wife disturbs my meditation one day. Right? And I blast. Oh, can't you see I'm doing a divine thing, meditating. <laughs> uh, this big picture I have of myself as a meditator. Right? So, and pictures are very, very easy to see. We will go into the really depth of the false personality. There's so much in the false personality and it all has to die. It's totally false. It has to die. <clears throat> Now every moment, <coughs> life is coming in through the five senses. Where does it go? What does it touch first? Does it touch the false personality? Does it touch the personality? Does it touch the essence? Where does it go? Every moment life is coming in. <coughs> It first goes to the personality. Now, if the personality is not willing to die, the personality has Icha Mrutyu. We have this character called Bhishma. Right? It has Icha Mrutyu. Huh? If you use the word ego, everybody has to personally decide for themselves. That is, everybody's own ego has to decide now enough is enough and I am willing to die. Then only the journey will start. Unless the ego says itself, huh? okay, I am ready for Icha Mrutyu. Nobody can kill the ego. It's not possible. It has to decide for its self. Right? That is why it has <clears throat> it can only die if it wants to die. This desire in the personality that I am willing to dissolve myself for the sake of the Essence. The essence feeds upon personality. The essence feeds upon personality. So the personality has to first decide, and this is everybody's personal individual decision. Okay, I am ready to die. Now, if the personality is not willing to die, what, what will become powerful? The false personality. Is this clear to everyone? No, please ask. Um, if the light is coming in through your five senses, Light. Light. You said the light comes in. Light. 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 Each moment life is coming in as an event. As an event. Event. Right? Doesn't that go first to the false personality? No. The false personality is there to judge it. It is here. The minute I attach a label like and dislike, the false personality will start coming in. Now I want to bring in consciousness. So it first goes to the personality. And before anything can happen, the personality has to come to a decision on its own that I am willing to die. If the personality is not willing to die, it will automatically go to the false personality. Can you understand? And then death, is that death of that personality? Um, yes, I'll just come. This personality has many eyes. It has many eyes. I father, I son, I student, I sportsman or whatever. 
Can you see how many eyes have we gathered over here? Innumerable. As we go into this, we will see each of these eyes is a separate person. It has its own small ego using the word. <laughs> each of these eyes is a separate person. Where is the problem? So I won't call it a problem, but where does the illusion come in? Where does the illusion come in? No, because why don't we feel this, that we are a multiplicity? Why do we always feel we are the same person all the time? Why, why do we live this? Supposing we are so many sitting over here, and if I say in each person all the Kauravs and all the Pandavas are there or all the 18 Akshoni Sena, right? So we have this big multiplicity. So I am not one single person, I am a crowd. I am a, but do I ever feel myself as a crowd? No, why? Why? Two things, two. One we've already done. We have a everybody uses the same checkbook, the name. Uh, whether it is a sportsman, the I which is a sportsman, uh, he comes and he's in charge just now. I'm playing the game and he uses the name Rajan. Then he goes away. Then the husband comes, right, and he uses the same name. Can you see? So one of the illusions is that because we have one name. We can never feel this, we never see this. What is the second illusion? The second illusion. It's very easy, very, very easy. All these guys in one room, huh, thousands of them, and they have only one telephone, one telephone to talk through. The mouth. <laughs> They have only one telephone to talk to. So all of them sign the same name and all of them use the same telephone. And because of that, we never are able to break this illusion that we are not one person. In the essence, we are really one. The real I is one. But that one I we cannot feel that one eye till all these eyes die. This illusion. And for that, we have to come to a state where we understand and feel ourselves not as one person but as a crowd. Only then will we know we are not one person. This is not just an intellectual understanding. And it comes only through self-observation. Only through self-observation. I fall in love with a girl, I get married to her. It's one, and I suddenly see it is one eye. Because just yesterday I was loving towards her, but today I'm hating the same person. And something has changed. If I'm observing inside, I'll say, this is not the same person. Where's that guy who was loving her? But he has gone somewhere else. And he's left the guest house in charge of someone else. Can you see? Just try to see your life. In the, supposing I'm writing these notes. Just take it. A small observation of writing these notes. So I come to the table and I say, okay, it's 8 o'clock. I'm going to write till 8.30. And this is one guy inside. He's just now in charge. Right? And I sit down over here and I write for two minutes and then there's some, someone else from the instinctive center, another I will come and this guy will go away somewhere else. I don't know where he's gone and say, Are ek cup chai ho jai. Huh? let's have a cup of tea. Right? Huh? So I'll leave this, I'll go to make the tea. Now after I make the tea, that guy has gone away. Uh, where he's gone, I don't know. And somebody else has come. I'm coming back to the two minutes. Uh, what has happened in the match? Who has called what? Okay. 
Do you see this happening in our lives? Can you see this happening in our lives? We are not one person. We are not one person. Every moment the owner is changing. And we all sign, and they all sign their names Rajan on the check. And I live in this illusion that I am the same person. Unless I can take my attention in and start observing this and each one is giving a different feeling of I. I'm having the tea, it's a different feeling of I. I'm watching the TV, it's a different feeling of I. That the one which is watching TV is interested in the match, he is the one inside who is interested in excitement. Uh, he wants to have excitement in life. But the one who wanted to have tea, he doesn't want excitement. He wants to sit and drink tea and be peaceful. Okay. And so what happens when you have two eyes of a false person, one watching TV and having a cup of tea together? Oh. Huh. Huh. There is something called... Oh. <laughs> I'll just talk about something else. <laughs> Now, because you've asked the question, it will be good to just go into it. See, from the divine, uh, in we say Satchit, Anand, or whatever, Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, but we leave all that on the side just now. Uh, we'll say three faculties are come out of the divine. They are consciousness. That which sees, that which can see, can observe, that is consciousness. It does darshan. Right? Sudarshan, the chakra of Krishna, consciousness. That is the first faculty huh? which comes from the divine. The second is what we have seen already is. It's ray of light which it sends out to experience the world. It, this attention is the divine moving out through the five senses to enjoy life. Now, because there is attention here, what else will we need? One more thing. One more thing. No, to control the attention. Ah, something. It will be a kind of intelligence which decides I want to pay attention to you and not to this. What is that? What is that? These are the three primary faculties of the divine consciousness attention and the power to control attention called will how much of attention where will i'm just keeping this because now there are three kinds of will The one you are talking about. There are two eyes in me. One wants to do the refining exercises, but there is this new movie called PK. The other one wants to go to watch PK. And they are struggling with each other. So each, each eye has its own will. Each eye has its own will and they will fight with each other inside. And the one whose will overpowers the Others will, I will do that. Right. Resultant will. What is the resultant? 
Can you see all these eyes within me, they have their own small will. What determines why one will will overpower another will within yourself? Hmm? What determines how one will overpowers the right. next one? Right, because behind, behind that eye will be a pattern and that pattern will have momentum. Pattern we call as sanskar. But that is why I've kept all these words on the side because we all automatically uh, make a picture of what we understand by that. Right? Behind the eye will be a pattern. Right? I, I may have a pattern of always going following what my five senses want to indulge in. I'm definitely not going to do the exercises. I'll run to the movie. Uh, it's going to win. Can you understand? It is only if I bring in consciousness and attention and will some other kind of will then will I say no I don't want to go to the movie I want to do my exercises that is the second kind of will we will call it intellectual will I have used my intellect Later, as we study the intellectual center, we'll come to many things. I, I have made use of my intellect and I said that, okay, maybe I've, I've mentated in some way, what we call as chintan, mentation. Hmm, chintan. Uh, the movie is there forever and ever. I can go to see it on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever. Uh, but today I want to do this just now. I don't want to miss it. So I've created an intellectual will. Just now, when we are in a total state of mechanicalness, all these eyes are fighting with each other and it is just neutral will. And the in intellectual will we call in Shastra as Manobal. Manobal. Right? And there is a very deep form of will which is spiritual will. Spiritual will. In Shastra, we will call it as Atmabal. Atmabal. But the term has been so misused now. Uh, people who reinforce their false personality, we say they have a lot of Atmabal. Uh, so the term has degenerated now, it has no meaning. It's lost its significance. Uh, so we use the word spiritual will. What could spiritual will mean? What could spiritual will mean? Suppose, oh sorry. Supposing we say the word dharma. Dharma. Dharma means the path. The path, right? Okay. And try to connect it with spiritual will. Spiritual. Try to connect it. In each moment of life, in each moment of life, we are coming to that, we are going back to this, we are coming to the same thing again. We've just di digressed a little. Each moment of life, I have a choice whether to rise in consciousness or to fall in consciousness. Not right and wrong. Please don't mix it up. We are not talking about morality. Whether to rise in consciousness or fall in consciousness. Right? If I rise in consciousness, I am following the path of dharma. And that will to do the right thing in the moment, to throw the attention on the right thing that allows me to rise in consciousness is spiritual will. But for that, like he said, I need a certain kind of intelligence, which we will talk about. It is called Vivek. 
the power of discriminating the power of discriminating and vivek can only come in a person when the false personality starts dissolving as long as the false personality is there we will have a false vivek <laughs> false vivek <laughs> Huh? We will translate Vivek in English as conscience. So we'll have a false conscience, not a real conscience. All of us have a false conscience. We all have beautiful ideas of what is right and what is wrong. And none of them are worth keeping. Right? But real Vivek will make use of spiritual will and each moment in life it will look at the moment in life and what path leads me to higher levels of consciousness and what path leads me deeper into the mechanicalness of life that is spiritual will so we'll go into this in spiritual will there is never any desire to change the circumstances. If he insults me, my intellectual will may tell him I better put him in his place. This we call in life as willpower. I had the willpower to show him what he is. You get what I'm trying to say? In spiritual will that will never come up. It's not possible. It's not possible. I'll immediately my consciousness will come in, the vivek will come in, and it will say that if you're feeling hurt, this is the only thing which can be hurt. Only the imaginary I can be hurt. The real I does not know the meaning of hurt. And if you're feeling hurt, use the fire of that hurt to burn the imaginary eye. That is called tapa. Use the fire of that hurt to burn the imaginary eye. And in that burning, what will be born? Real conscience will be born. Real conscience. Can, can, am I coming across in all this? It is not, tapa is not something I go and do at a particular place or I'm fasting for 15 days or all. Nothing to do with that. Please understand, if I am fasting for 15 days, why am I fasting? And if I'm fasting to tell him that I am such a good faster, <laughs> right? All that fasting goes into the It may be some vrat or something and I am doing some puja. But I make a big, uh, this thing about the puja. Why am I doing it? Okay. Yeah, Rajinai, I understand what you say. Huh. But in this day and age, same working in an environment where that environment needs for you to, you know, be able to hold your own. Otherwise, you'd be eaten up by the lions outside. Right. No. And that is why in the beginning as you start practicing, you don't tell anyone about it. The minute you tell somebody about it, you're gone. It is only when you have come to a state where you can hold your own in the marketplace. Right? Socrates going through the marketplace and he comes back and he's laughing and dancing. And his disciples asking him, ask him, what, what's happened to you? And he says, I went through the whole marketplace. There were so many beautiful things, but nothing attracted me. Right? When we are able to control our attention through will, please understand, in intellectual will, there can be tension. In spiritual will, there is only deep relaxation. It is, uh, it, it is like the Taoists say, effortless effort, <laughs> effortless effort, or doing by non-doing, hmm? right? So, 
Is this little clear? I'm going to this time go deep into the subject of Vivek. What is Vivek? Conscience. I want to bring it out because we are so much into morality that we have forgotten that uh, real, uh, spirituality has nothing to do with morality. It has to do not with right or wrong. It has to do with sat and asat. Rising in consciousness is sat. Falling into mechanicalness is asat. It has nothing to do with right or wrong. By saying the truth, if my ego is becoming more powerful, I have gone into asat. I, I have spoken the truth. Now what happens to him? What do I care? Huh? Right? Gone. Finished. Because there is no external considering. External considering in the old days we used to call as bhakti. I don't use that. but. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed all the we changed all the terms. They're not mine. They're not mine. Hmm? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> but I'll take this very deep. I want to just finish this background, hmm? and we'll go. In, what is the inner power of discrimination? Right? And what is vivek? Real vivek? Real conscience? Okay. Is this little clear? Then I'll just go back to this one. Now, like I said, every moment life is coming in. Every moment life is coming in. The first thing, if we vomit life out, then nothing is going to happen. And vomiting life out is just a reaction. So I'm assuming that now we are trying to work on ourselves to reach a state that we are trying not to react at least externally we don't react hmm? maybe internally it will take a long time right i now i don't get irritated on him externally but maybe inside there is still irritation it's still there but at least let us come to that state let us create that much of will inside will is dharana shakti let us create that much of will from this day from this day we say we are not going to react outside at least. No reactions outside. Whatever the situation. I may be 150% right or 200% right. Makes no difference. Reaction is wrong. Huh? Reaction is wrong. And my aim is to be free of reaction. My aim is not to say the truth. My aim is to be free of reaction. And unless I'm free of that reaction, I cannot move in. Because I try to move in, but I react and I throw it out. And that's the end of the matter. Nothing has gone ahead. Nothing has gone ahead. And the basic reaction is like and dislike. Each moment, we are labeling the moment like and dislike. It's going to take hard work because we want to move beyond this like and dislike. Okay, now we said life comes in and touches the personality. Life comes in, touches the personality. Now we are going to uh, we are going to say that we follow either of two paths, two paths. One we will call as life, the other we will call as sadhana, work. Both of them have their own truths. Right? Life has its own truths. 
Sadhana has its own truths. If I follow the truths of life, what will become powerful? My false personality will become powerful. If I follow the truths of and this has come to us from people who have already experienced. They have passed this down to us. Hmm? They pass this down in different forms. Uh, some people they they are not they cannot put it in a very scientific way, so they put it in a different way, uh, in a very basic way. But still, the truth is the same, right? <coughs> so this has come from that group of humanity who have experienced truth and. Through their compassion, they want others also to rise in consciousness and experience truth. Right? So they leave something for us and we want to take each moment, we want to, whether we take the truth from life or this. Huh? You can't see the green? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <coughs> Where does my truth come from? Each moment of my life, right? Now we take any example. Disturb, correct? Now, take any example hmm, that we go back to say somebody insults me, right? Now, if I take a truth from life, I will say I have to save my reputation. I will say I have to save my reputation. Oh, what does he think of himself? Who is he to say these kinds of mm -hmm. words to me? And my feeling of I is coming from the false personality. That insult has first come to the personality. The personality is not willing to die. Is not willing to die. So I argue with him. I react with him. I get angry with him. A new pattern of that anger goes in, of irritation goes into my subconscious. The false personality becomes powerful. Can you see? Right? And what have I wasted over here? Can somebody tell me what have I wasted? What have I wasted? Hmm? See, you've insulted me. I'm feeling hurt. I'm feeling hurt. Now, in this reaction with you, what have I wasted? Attention. Attention, but something with that hurt, what has come? There is that a feeling of friction inside. A friction, a, a feeling of burning inside. Can you see what I'm trying to say? Somebody has spat on my car. Is there a feeling of burning inside? Mm -hmm. Now, do I make, make right use of that heat or do I make wrong use of that heat? You're not getting what I'm trying to say. Right use of that heat is tapa. Austerity. Austerity is not the... It's the English translation, but we can't really say what the word tapa means. Can you understand what I'm trying to say? Just a small thing, somebody has just said some few words to me of criticism or whatever. Right? I am feeling hurt inside. Am I burning inside? <laughs> right? Now, if I waste that heat by throwing it out on him, I'm using that heat to throw it out on him. My false personality, life came in, it came to the personality. I made the false personality part. But if I bring in consciousness and I say, 
that I which has a picture of itself as someone is feeling hurt hold the heat don't throw away the heat then that heat that very fire becomes tapa and in that a small part of the false personality burns it dissolves the ego dissolves a little in that and the food goes to the essence the food goes to the essence it sounds so beautiful but in that you could destroy your career in, in Europe you mm -hmm. can destroy your career literally because why if you, if you uh, why why yeah if you a doctor for right. example, and someone insults you your mm -hmm. reputation is being more and standing mm -hmm. and if you want to feel that you just right and you allow that to happen then on the one side you destroying what you have come on earth to play as a role right right, right. okay and now let's side. go back to the same example let's go back to the same example hmm. supposing you are a doctor right and somebody is spreading false whatever right what we call it, it happens everywhere in life and you're feeling hurt can you make right use of that heat and still play your role in life i'm asking so okay i'll just give you another example let's go to something else and come back to it see one of the things we were taught was to be free of memory i've not come to it we are not talking about memory but we come to it at some time right to be free of memory because we are slaves of memory we don't realize it so supposing i am having a conversation with you right and you say something hmm? and maybe you say that uh, i saw an article that coca cola is like this and immediately something associates with in my memory and i say in my mobile phone i have a film of coca cola like this right so have i become a victim of memory just a mechanical victim of memory and i want to break this i want to break this and this happens all the time all the time it's happening and happening so can i pause over there can i pause over there i don't see it i don't see it after a few minutes i'll feel a kind of freedom inside that i didn't allow memory to i use my will not will power i use my will and the minute i feel that freedom then i tell him okay i have something in my mobile now it is not coming as a reaction from memory you have to play your role in life but our aim is to be free of reaction and maybe i not not maybe i take out the maybe definitely if you are free of reaction and if you can then tackle that problem without any reaction inside you will tackle it in a completely different way can can you, without become a victim becoming a victim of that negativity let's go back to what we talked about <coughs> inner state outer event inner state outer event now somebody is testing how you can react to this <laughs> <laughs>
let us look a little further little further you say and it happens to all of us that somebody is spreading something about me supposing i tackle it through reaction then in that reaction i'm totally blind right i'm totally hypnotized by the event there is no consciousness i'm just a, a mechanical slave of the event of life events of life right now this situation has come in my life this situation where something like this is happening now if i tackle that situation through reaction which is not really tackle because i just vomited out right through a reaction am i sowing a seed for something like that to happen again can you see the law of karma operating am i in that very reaction it may just now he may shut up that guy whoever is doing what but have i sown a seed for future repetition can you understand but if i use my vivek and i tackled him in a different way where there is no negativity no reaction then can that incident come in my life again ever so it's not just this moment but in this moment what seed are we sowing what seed are we sowing so that very consciousness sows a seed for something totally new and that very reaction is saying please come to me again so every moment life is coming into the personality and either it can make the false personality it can be, sorry it can become food for the false personality or it can become food for the essence and it is in our hands it is in our hands and this is every moment of life what do we want what is our aim do we value our aim if our aim is to have the original feeling of i which is behind everything then we will value essence because within essence will be the real i you get what i'm trying to say but if i value my reputation i value my name hmm or <clears throat> and this could be so many things can you and try to see a person who is in false personality what would be certain characteristics of false personality time just goes away hi <laughs> say let us take one one at a time i'll i'll get rid of this but today and tomorrow let us talk of false personality <clears throat> supposing my false personality is very strong let us try to let us try now start observing ourselves what would be the first characteristic i would not be able to i would not be able to I love it. Huh? Uh, two people fighting, uh, and then one people, one person goes away, and then he remembers something, and he comes back. <laughs> oh, it's such a beautiful scene! Such a beautiful scene! Right? Can you see the false person? How much are we holding on to? Can we just let go? How much are we holding on? To? what's all lying in our safe deposit box how much are we holding on 
somebody did this, somebody did that. And there was one guy who used to phone me at least seven times a day and said, please show me God so I can shoot him. <laughs> The whole world is at fault and it can never be my fault. The whole world is at fault and I'm holding on to so much, holding on. And out of this holding on, what comes? What is the characteristic of holding on? What is the characteristic of holding on? That I'm holding on to something. What is the characteristic? Something goes on inside all the time. That I'm holding on. I'm always making accounts. I'm always making accounts. I have this small grudge within me. Maybe my father and mother didn't give me a proper education. Now, every time some situation comes in life, I'm making an account. Can you see all this is gathering up in some place? It's not going away anywhere. Small accounts I make all the time. And out of this making, now we are moving deeper into the false personality. What, what comes out of inner accounting? What comes out of inner accounting? What is the lowest emotion we can fall to the lowest emotion we can huh? self-pity self it comes out of accounting I'm accounting all the time I did so much for you but you don't care about me. I'm accounting all the time and when I was ill nobody cared to phone me also. right we are accounting all the time. And this accounting goes on and where does it come to? Just we write one more word. All the great teachers, they have all agreed on one thing, that acceptance is the door to the divine. Right? Nobody will argue with this. Right? Now, can we see this non-acceptance of in us, a kind of inner accounting, growing out of that inner accounting each moment? Try to see it. Supposing I read the newspaper and I say, oh, there's too much corruption in India. Is it acceptance? No, I'm saying something is happening which is unjust. Can you get what I'm trying to say? But the journey starts with acceptance. This is very difficult to understand, very, very difficult to understand. It's very easy to speak about it. Acceptance. And we have, we have always a fact. And this monkey is constantly chattering, can't accept. And it's very easy to say, but acceptance of the fact, this is as it is. To accept, right? So let go. But we can't let go. We are 
holding on to so much or uh, somebody has just done some small thing and what is sweeter in life what is sweeter in life is it sweeter to forgive somebody or is it sweeter to take revenge on somebody <laughs> huh can, I, can you can you imagine the feeling of i the feeling of i when i'm taking revenge <laughs> oh what a feeling <laughs> revenge just go back to we we had this feeling all of us we talk so much about forgiveness but how can we forgive if we are accounting inside all the time how can we forgive unless this inner accounting drops completely then only we can come to a state of where we are able to forgive somebody till then this feeling of i of revenge what a feeling it is i take revenge on him it's as if i've eaten the best pudding in my life <laughs> this when you live in a community we we in ancient communities we we i do so you must you know and if ever for you that you know huh? that communities we if one does then that that in accounting then you must do in another form um how when that mindset of the masses is like that and you grow up in that kind of community that then is very hard to change No, no, but that doesn't matter. I'm not talking about that community. Just now, we have realized this fact. Do we want to make an effort to wake up from this? Are we? Do we realize the importance of this? That this monkey is accounting all the time. I don't like this car. Maybe tomorrow I'll get a better car. It's accounting, right? And you will sit in your car, and the starter won't start, and you will start accounting against him. that i told you to take it for repairs can you see moment to moment we are accounting and unless this we are free of this pattern of accounting we can never let go and it's all a part of the false perception Because of course God doesn't know how to account. <laughs> Just this understanding. Supposing I go to a shop, I go to a shop, and I buy this. Say I buy it for ten rupees, and he comes and he says, "Arey, I bought it for eight rupees. What stops? <laughs> The accounting." <laughs> the accounting there is no external considering of that oh i had the beautiful emotion of helping someone out with 2 rupees more that it doesn't come it doesn't come it's the competitive value huh it's the competitive value so this we have to be free of this and it takes if you start now it's going to take few years of inner observation where this will drop and it can happen in anything somebody may criticize my god i start accounting somebody will criticize my guru i start accounting somebody will criticize my profession i start accounting can you hard work so the first characteristic of the false personality it cannot let go and in this business which we are moving into we have to cancel our debts right now whatever my debt whether you owe me i owe you from this very moment my accounts are settled over 
I have written off, only then can I forgive. And please remember, the I cannot forgive. It is in the dissolution of the I that what remains is forgiveness. Okay, another characteristic of the false personality. Tomorrow I'm going to take all the parts of the false personality. <clears throat> Second one. This is the fourth visit over here. In any of the talks, have I taken the law of the pendulum? Mm -hmm. yeah. I have taken the law of the pendulum. Okay. So, a typical characteristic of the false personality, it always moves in extremes. Oh, I really like this. Stroke, such strong likes. And then suddenly, the other side, such strong dislikes. And they keep on moving from one end of the pendulum to the other end of the pendulum. You tell them about the exercises, or they love the exercises, they'll start doing it. After six months, they're doing something else. And everything is in false personality. They keep on swinging. And this happens with people who are very centered in the emotional center, in the lower emotions. They keep on swinging in life. For six months something is very right, then again they go into something which is absolutely wrong. And there is no stability in life. What else comes from this swinging? What are they doing all the time? This swinging you can see in another way. What he said just now, what did he say? They are always comparing themselves with other people. Comparing themselves, I am better than this. They will compare in such a way that the other person is a little lower than what I am. <laughs> And this reinforces the false personality because it always is giving me a feeling that I am better than somebody else. And that very deeply embedded pattern, that it is not even a pattern, it is a deeply embedded attitude that I am better than everybody, it gets stronger and stronger. Every time I compare myself with somebody else. I can understand when a child is growing up, there is comparison, that comparison is needed, etc. But here we are on a journey to be free of the false personality. They have a kind of frozen psychology. Strong, they, they will approve of this set of people and disapprove of this set of people. Strong likes and dislikes. And, and this can shift from somebody who is in the approved list can shift to the <laughs> disapproved list. See, these are all characteristics of the <laughs> for them. Life is two ways: either this or that. Uh, Christ says. A camel can go through the eye of a needle, but a rich man cannot enter by kingdom of God. He's not talking about money. He's not talking. He's a person who is rich, means who is full of himself. The false personality cannot enter the kingdom of God. It has to die. And that is why my guru used to always use the word, uh, term, big shoe, empty the boat, throw away the false personality. Throw it away. Big shoe, empty the boat. 
unless we make empty this we cannot make room for something else something which is higher today i wanted to go deeper into the feeling of i but i'll leave that for tomorrow can you see false personality it attracts unreal situations in life it attracts unreal people in life it attracts unreal things in life and it gives us a feeling that we are unreal or an unreal position in life try to see people who live in pictures see the politicians they are living in pictures they have this unreal feeling that they are something there is no reality at all the way they walk the way they come on tv observe all this not to criticize them but to see our own false personality <clears throat> and as the false personality drops so much will change in our life because to hold everything that is false we have to be intention all the time suddenly we relax so deeply then life is a joy then that joy does not come from something false that i gain something to most in the very dissolution of the ego there is joy each moment to moment the false personality uses certain terms in this comparison thank god i am not like him right he eats and drinks every night he drinks uh, two bottles of this every night and i fast three days a week right thank god i am not like him and all the fasting is going in the wrong place and of course he is a cheat and i am a very good person and he is unjust and i am just in everything and in my life i have not never done any harm to anyone i have always thought of people as good and if somebody came and saw the way i talk to treat my wife they would know how i do good to everyone see everything is false in us and because of this we cannot think or feel or sense that reality in the essence and it is so beautiful but we are hung up in all these false things we are glued to our sensual thinking to our sensual things to our sensual indulgences and one final thing before what happens when we judge others what happens when we judge others what happens when we what have we done see we saw that the false personality is pictures of our self imaginary pictures of our self when i am judging somebody else what am i doing i am making a imaginary picture about him <laughs> and when i judge someone what kind of feeling of i do i get at that time is it it's totally false totally false that i am something better than someone i am something greater than someone that i can judge him totally false feeling of i all this is a part of false personality i can keep on talking and talking about it right uh, but tomorrow i'll take a few of the feelings of i different feelings of i and then i'll list all the parts of the false personality so it will help us in observing it within our selves huh? and i think then we this is what i wanted to complete as a sort of background to the subject which i wanted to take so that we'll start from day after tomorrow and any questions anyone any questions okay
Thank you. Jai Shri Krishna. Good night. With God's grace, we will be the end of our